Hi 7130 students, we're going to take a look today at David Ozabel's Meaningful Reception Learning and I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the key concepts of this theory and then you can view the PowerPoint that has some more information. Um, first of all, your textbook specifically says that Meaningful Reception Learning is not really considered a particularly current theory. So, if that's the case, why bother looking at it? Um, well, your text also mentions that a number of the aspects of his theory have become a standard part of educational practice. We do a lot of the things that are discussed in his theory, even though the, whole, the theory as a whole may not be considered all that current. So, it's worth looking at. Alright, so let's look at a couple of different things that Ozabel says. First of all, he um, acknowledges that meaning is not in a book or outside a learner, he says that anything that we want to experience and make meaningful, we have to make meaning of. So it's text plus learner, look at that, equals meaning. All right? All right, assuming that you act on it in a meaningful way. And even though this is sort of a, um, a, a constructivist sort of a notion, we don't really put Ozabel in the constructivist theories, but we're just, we're, we'll come back to that. He makes two important distinctions, and so we've got to look at these two important distinctions to sort of set up our, our theory here. <clears throat> he distinguishes between reception and discovery learning, so one of these is reception versus discovery learning, and his other distinction is meaningful versus rote learning. Okay, meaningful versus rote. Oh, so we have reception versus discovery learning. And he says, mo and, and, and this is important for Ozabel because he says that most school learning is reception learning. That is, most school learning occurs with teachers presenting most of what they want the students to know to them. Sort of like I'm doing to you right now. We're not discovering this theory. We're not doing research and going out there and trying to pull together um, ideas. I'm explaining some things to you, so we're trying to make it, uh, it is reception learning. I'm organizing the content and I'm giving it to you in a way that hopefully you can make some sense out of it. <clears throat> okay? He says discovery learning is useful, but discovery learning is not really a good primary means of communicating information. Now this is his theory, you don't have to agree with it, okay? Not a good primary means of learning. Sure, there's things you need to discover, but there's a lot of content that just needs to be presented, so you have a good sense of what's going on in the discipline of learning, LRMG. That's my abbreviation for learning. Okay, so the second distinction he makes is between meaningful versus rote learning. All right, and meaningful learning is learning that has some meaning to the learner, okay? Has meaning to the learner, as opposed to rote learning which is something that you just memorize or you just hear, but it has no meaning, no meaning, okay? So there's no meaning here. That's why we're putting that line through it. And we don't want verbatim memorization. We don't want students to just memorize things. We want a connection between what you already know and what you're trying to learn. That's where the meaningfulness come in, comes in. So meaningfulness connects, okay, what is known already to what is being learned. And this is what Ozabel refers to as meaningful, okay? When we have a connection, when these two things are connected, okay? All right, so he came up with a theory that he calls meaningful reception learning, right? That's what we have right up here, meaningful reception learning. So teachers are going to teach, they're going to present content as a primary means of learning for students, but it has to be meaningful. And so he talks about some different learning processes that are involved in meaningful learning, and he also talks about how your cognitive structure is organized. And the processes are something that we will come to in the next um, little video in a PowerPoint presentation. But let's talk a little bit about cognitive organization. Okay, cognitive organization. Oops, I think that's if I had some screen organization here, wouldn't it? And some coordination. Um, he talks about cognitive structure as what you know, your overall memory structure or the integrated body of knowledge that you have. So your cognitive structure is 
your brain what you already know. And he says that the cognitive structure, okay, is hierarchically organized. So we said, he says we have big ideas, and underneath that we have some smaller ideas, and this helps us to understand the organization of our memory system, okay? That it, our cognitive organization is done hierarchically. Another important component of the cognitive organization in the learner is an anchoring idea. And an anchoring idea, or an anchor, is just a specific, rel specific, specific relevant idea that new information can be attached to to make it meaningful. So it's something that you already have in your cognitive structure. It's an idea you already have in your cognitive structure that the new idea can be connected to in order to make that new information meaningful. So as you're reading about learning theories in this class, you should be thinking about experiences you have with learning and then trying to come up with examples or applications of the particular new learning theories to your to the learning examples or learning experiences you've had in the past. Um, another example of an anchoring idea might be, let's say that you're going to talk about the book Hoot. Okay, can't think of the author of Hoot right this minute. Um, I know he also wrote Flush. Um, Carl Hyacin, okay? And you're going to do a lesson on um, Hoot. And one of the things you're getting ready to do is talk to the kids about what Hoot is about. You're going to give them an advanced organizer, something to help get them ready to read this book. And you ask any of them if they've ever seen an owl before. Okay? All right. Has any of y'all ever seen an owl? And where do owls live? Owls live right in trees. Well, this book is all about owls, but it's about owls that live somewhere else. Okay, so what are you doing? You've got this anchoring idea of owl. And now you're going to change their understanding a little bit. You're going to give them a new example of an owl, but you're going to change their understanding a little bit. And you're going to connect this new idea of an owl to this existing idea. You're going to say this book is about owls that live in the ground. Okay? So there are some owls that live in the ground. They're burrowing owls. And that's what this book is about. So think about what you know about owls as you read this book. Okay, and you've hooked this new idea that owls, burrowing owls, live in the ground to the existing idea of owls, and that's how an anchoring idea works. All right, that's it for this video.